We've always kind of been like, just put us in as many buckets as you can, <laughs> you know? We're just a bunch of friends that have been playing together for 20 years, having the time of our lives still 20 years later, you know? But like once you see us, I think most people will come back. Greetings, friends. Keith Billick here. Thank you so much for joining me. Are you looking for a podcast where you can hear about playing the banjo, banjo music, banjo stories, all from the world's top banjo players? I have great news. You have found the correct podcast. This is the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast, brought to you by our friends at Peghead Nation, Elderly Instruments, Page Capos, and Sullivan Banjos. Like I said, I am Keith Billick, and I will be your tour guide for this part of your banjo journey. I do have one quick, exciting announcement before we get started. If you want to learn banjo directly from me in person, I've been hired to be on the faculty this year for the Midwest Banjo Camp. That's happening this June 6th through 9th uh, over in Manchester, Indiana. Head over to MidwestBanjoCamp.com. The, the list of instructors is just insane. There's way too many for me to list, but suffice to say, I am probably the least impressive instructor on that list. You will be uh, quite impressed. And uh, for those of you who can make it, uh, make sure you come say hi to me while we're there. And whether you are going to the Midwest Banjo Camp or any other banjo camp or banjo festival, bluegrass festival or event, or if you're just walking down the street in your town, the best way to identify yourself as someone of the utmost sophistication and high culture is to wear your official Picky Fingers logo merchandise, which all of that can be found at banjopodcast.com. You can get your official Picky Fingers t-shirts, hats, stickers, hoodies, all that stuff. So yeah, check it out, banjopodcast.com. I have cool colors in all sorts of sizes. Uh, so yeah, get yourself ready for the uh, festival season. And perhaps the best way to support the show is to become a VIP, a very important picker listener. And today's VIP listener of the show is Tom Donovan. Tom, thank you so much for your generous support of the podcast. I truly appreciate it. How do you become a VIP listener, you might wonder? Well, I'll tell you what, it's by going to my Patreon site, which is patreon.com slash banjo podcast. I know I'm throwing a lot of websites at you, but uh, they're all in the show notes too. So uh, yeah, patreon.com slash banjo podcast. How it works is you sign up to throw just a few measly dollars per month my way, and it does go directly to support the show. It makes a huge difference. So uh, Tom Donovan and the rest of the VIP listeners really appreciate it. And if none of those things are quite your style, there are other ways to support the show that don't involve any money. Like uh, this podcast actually gets published to YouTube, for example. So that does help when you watch it on YouTube. There's really nothing to watch. It's still just the audio track. But uh, hitting the like and subscribe, if that's what you're doing, that all helps with the, uh, you know, the old algorithm. So if you want to be a part of the quest for banjo world domination... That's uh, those are all good ways to do it. And don't forget to email me directly, Pinky Fingers Banjo Podcast at gmail.com. I've been driving on this road from home. I barely know. I've been driving for so long that this road might be my home. Today's featured guest is Kevin Kniebel, the banjoist and a vocalist with the Minneapolis-based band Pertnier Sandstone. Now, at first glance, Pertnier Sandstone seems like one of those hard-driving, 
energetic foot stomp and types of old time bands, but they are a bit more than that. They really pull from some of the jamgrass sensibilities, like some creative, multi influential songwriting, cool arrangements, and featuring multiple singers and songwriters. So it all gets blended together to give them a really cool, unique sound. And Kevin, being a great banjo player, is of course the driving force behind a lot of that, which you will hear about right now. So give a warm picky fingers welcome to Kevin Kniebel. How I found my way to the banjo, I guess, was by a process of elimination. I was in this band with my high school friends and other people wanted to sing songs. And so that meant I'd either have to play an instrument or stand there looking dumb. And so we were at a bluegrass festival and we kind of saw all the bandos around. We realized we didn't have one in our band. We weren't really even a old time inspired modern string band yet, which is maybe what we are now. Uh, but uh-huh. I was like, well, nobody's playing the banjo yet. How hard could it be? Um, and it was pretty hard. Wait, so the, <laughs> so, so the band you were in in high school, was that still, was that the early stages of Pert Near Sandstone? I know you guys have been around for a while. Well, I probably said that in a confusing way, but we started, I was, I was probably about 24 when the band got together, but it was with friends that I had had since high school. Gotcha, gotcha, um, gotcha. And so, you know, we'd known each other for over a decade already when the band started, so. Wow, amazing. So you said you weren't, already a, a progressive old time band or whatever were you an acoustic band or is this we like were, a, a rock yeah. and roll band no we were an acoustic band yeah so we okay um two of the guys that were in the band to start uh one well, the guitar player's name is jay lens and our, our original fiddle player's name is ryan young who is now in trampled by turtles mm-hmm. and uh you know we'd all known each other since we were real young and uh, I, I had a, a job that was keeping me really busy, and uh, my boss told me that I needed to find a hobby. And so these guys, I was living with Jay, and you know, I had like uh, this idea that if we got like a twelve pack, they had one free night that they weren't already practicing with other bands. And so every, I don't know if it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday, but for you know, almost a year, every Tuesday we were playing old like Garcia Grisman, Bob Dylan, you know, then we started to play like more new folk music. And then uh, Nate Sype, who was the fiddle and mandolin player, showed up not too long after we, the three of us, you know, got together maybe a time or two without him. And he ran into somebody, one one of those two guys at a party and he's like, you're playing folk music and you didn't invite me. So he had been hopping (laughs) trains um, all over like Canada and, and the upper Pacific Northwest area. And he took a mandolin with him and kind of learned how to play mandolin. And so he showed up a really, really big fan of the new Lost City Ramblers. And so we kind of, for a long time, were just, you know, doing that folk music and playing lots of new Lost City Ramblers songs, <laughs> uh, which was really fun. And, um, and yeah, it just it kind of grew from there. You know, you get interested in a certain style of music and then you get really kind of do the deep dive and figure out like where this come from and who do I like and um, yeah start to connect all the dots of, yeah. of what you're hearing yeah 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 I kind Absolutely. of feel like it was a pretty uh, like many things in my life unplanned uh, and yet couldn't have worked out any better you know so so you said you uh, came to it by process of elimination does that mean that it seemed like every other instrument had been accounted for other than banjo is that what you mean yeah we had a bass player we had a guitar player <laughs> uh, we had a mandolin player we had a fiddle player and I played guitar, but I wasn't, you know, any good at it. And so I, I was like, well, maybe I can figure out the banjo. And I did try to learn a uh, three finger style for almost a full year, uh, hmm. took lessons and everything and wasn't up to a point where I felt like I could get anywhere near a stage letting anyone knew I play the banjo. And, uh, so I was going to yeah. give it up actually, but the mandolin player in our band, uh, was working at a guitar shop and he said, Hey, there's this guy that teaches people this other style banjo you should come check it out and you know i had a pretty good chord vocabulary from failing to learn the three finger style for almost a year (laughs) and uh and you know he i think it was like you know on a thursday i had a lesson and we had a show like the next day or the day after and i was playing the banjo on stage so it just kind of i was like oh this actually in a claw hammer style yeah on yep wow tell me more about this festival that you said you went to that what seemed to be pivotal in some way for you yeah there's a great uh, old time and bluegrass community in Minnesota, uh, you know, old time 
bands, bluegrass bands, and related bands all kind of together in this community. It's called uh, Mabatwa, which is, you know, uh, Minnesota Bluegrass and Old Time Music Association. And they put on four festivals a year in the Minnesota area, um, two in the summer, uh, one in the winter, and one in the fall. Okay. And, um, you know, we, we were like, wow, we got all this resource right around us when we first got interested in this music. It's like all these people playing these traditions, you know, and we were like, hey, we like camping. What if we went to this camping festival? You know, we've never <laughs> yeah. been to a, a camping bluegrass festival. We've been to other kind of camping festivals, you know, where, where there's lots of music and late night mischief. But we were like, oh, the mischief here is you just stay up until the sun comes up playing bluegrass. <laughs> just That's pretty play, awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Do you remember um, like certain acts that you saw that inspired you or was it just kind of like the, oh, the yeah. community in general that was inspiring? Yeah, you know, I would say that festival, we were really lucky. Uh, like, you know, we, we kind of on a whim decided to go. And then on a whim, decided to go to the dance tent at a certain time, and just just getting real fired up was the Wilders. You ever heard that band? Sure, yeah. And oh my, they they just blew our hair back and. Betsy Ellis on the fiddle and, um, you know, just the whole crew of them playing. It was old time honky tonk and Western swing, you know, it was kind of their thing. And, and they were just the best at it. And, um, you know, we'd been playing in little coffee shops, you know, with like a tree uh, of microphones around us, you know, and, uh -huh. and we were like, well, well, what are they doing around just that one microphone? What's about to happen here? Like, where's the rest of the microphones? And we just we were kind of like oh and that's how it's supposed to be done you know they were just working that one mic and so much energy and really like high octane old time stuff you know she is like the fieriest fiddler around yeah um, they're like the perfect dance tent yeah band oh man that's so from great all the energy that they have yeah yeah and like i think you know the next week or whatever we went out we, we waited after and we're like well what hey what what model of microphone is that <laughs> you know uh -huh. and uh we were the proud owner of a uh, at4033 i think like the next week you know we're like oh let's, yeah let's do it that, that'll be fun to figure that out and it's kind of been a part of our stage act anyway ever since you know we we eventually kind of uh, because of where we were playing maybe the time of night we were playing uh etc the kind of people that were coming out to see us uh, it didn't really make any sense to just play around microphones anymore so we had to figure out how to get a lot louder so we like plugged in and you know we have all kinds of different method of uh you know kind of sound reinforcement in the band but we still kind of preserve that one microphone dynamic you know uh and yeah yeah so for a long time just until after covid now we have two mics on stage uh even though there's four singers you know so um, they've multiplied yeah 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 covid protocol <laughs> so were you um since you however you put it came into it by process of elimination i guess it's it might be understandable if you weren't really that inspired but it seems like at this point you've become inspired by the banjo did yeah. that bug bite you like right away were you getting into you know, diving in and learning how to play and what, like, what did you do after that? Yeah. So, I mean, I was into banjo before that. I think a lot of people that came to the music the way I came to the music, maybe their first banjo player that they heard was Jerry Garcia. That was probably not mine, but it's the first one I remember. Uh, I grew up listening yeah. to classic country, so I definitely it was exposed to a lot of banjo as a kid. You mm -hmm. know, my first concert was a Willie Nelson concert. And I mean, I, I remember all that kind of growing up as being kind of yeah. a big deal. But uh, the three finger style, like I really got into it when I heard "Old in the Way." But like I say, I I was not able to figure out how to do that. <laughs> so, hmm. um, from there, I I you know once I learned about the claw hammer, I was like, well, I wonder what I could get into as it relates to that, you know. And uh, right, and I, I had a friend who had been you know on the on the scene for a long time and and had met these guys had spent some time in colorado met these guys in a band called, called high on the hog oh you, yeah you ever know that band yeah, yeah. i i knew that um are you familiar was was the fiddler's name brian roman when when you knew them oh or at all or no 
I mean, he's a friend of mine, and he was he was in there, but yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's the name is familiar, but the the ones that I was, you know, it might have been Brian, and then Ryan, right, and then Kurt. Yeah, I don't know any of the others. He he was just a Michigan guy oh, who ended you. up out there. I got you. Yeah, Ryan Spearman, who I think is now in St. Louis, maybe. And uh, anyway, Kurt also broke. I think was the, a lot of those guys could play multiple instruments, but I think Kurt was the main. Kurt also broke was the main banjo player. I think. Um, okay. <laughs> but anyway, I got into them just on archive.org. I mean, I was somebody was oh, like, wow. you know, I can't find the record and print anywhere, but they've got, you know, 40 shows on archive.org. And so I just was like, you know, everywhere I went, I was listening to those MP3s. It's just this great, crisp, driving, um, yeah. you know, old time Clawhammer style, which I loved. And that's kind of what really bit me was listening to that band. So it seems like, yeah, between being inspired by the Wilders and High on the Hog and just kind of what you've said, is that really the thing that gets you off about the banjo is that hard driving, upbeat kind of style? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, uh, I will say that I, I really appreciate and like love people who play more melodic and delicate claw hammer, um, uh-huh. but no one would accuse me of that, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's still time i uh, hope so but yeah i mean yeah i get most excited about like yeah that real foot stomp and you know um from a player's standpoint is there a way that you are able to work on that or would maybe recommend other people working on it to to achieve that kind of sound uh, you mean like the, the drive yeah yeah if other people who are listening want to want to achieve that how would you suggest they approach that yeah, I mean, for for me, I think a lot of it uh, at the beginning, anyway, felt like it was in my setup. Uh, like I wanted to play harder than my body would allow me to, because <laughs> uh, I because oh. I would like you know I'd, I'd be bleeding a lot. Um, but I, I have a, I get a fake nail put on uh, at a salon like every three or four weeks. They just get like just an get acrylic. Warm. Yep, just an acrylic. Yep. Okay. And uh, yeah, probably for you know thirteen, fourteen years now, I've had. One on mostly on this finger. I started with my middle finger um, when I first started playing claw hammer, and that, I don't know why. Somebody said it didn't matter, uh, and so I was like, okay, well, I'll use my middle finger. And then it started to feel like it it did matter, and that the index finger was better, so I switched to that. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, and for, how often? How yeah. often does each nail that? Like, how often do you have to go back? This in nail, there to do like that? it's it's already grown out about four millimeters, and I got to put it on probably like a week and a half ago or something like that two weeks ago maybe and uh they still work as long as they don't you know you can just file them down until i probably you know i could go every two weeks but i typically go every month and a half got it got it it's like now, five bucks so it's like you know it's it's really oh yeah even on a banjo player's income like yeah that that's seriously. kind of affordable <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, and I just like come in at odd hours at this neighborhood place, and I just give them, I just tip them nicely, and they just are like, "Oh, just one, come here, you can sneak in ahead of this lady." So that's nice. <laughs> Perfect. Remind me what town you're in right now? Minneapolis. Yeah. So Minneapolis. Okay. That's that's kind of another part of I think what kind of drove me to to play the banjo is that there's so much folk music in Minneapolis and the West Bank scene. You know where folks like Spider John Kerner and um, you know Powder Milk Biscuit jug band and like you know the west bank folk music that was probably most made famous but on the prairie home companion but also through like you know sure like i say spider john and you know bob dylan obviously came through that scene for a hot minute too but um yeah there's a rich folk tradition still here um my wife for example is a, in a in a dancing troupe that does clog dancing and it's oh, been nice. a this Appalachian clog dancing, like you know, kind of square dance formations. I guess they maybe they call it precision clogging or something. But uh, they've been a thing since like the early '80s, you know, and it's still a group here. So it's like the legacy wow. of uh, it's like an institution, you know, uh, yeah. the, the folk music community in in Minneapolis. Um, so anyway, I, oh, know, that's I, so great. Yeah, yeah. I got a lesson once from a guy who's really well loved around here, uh, named Bill Hinckley, who's wonderful, uh, multi instrumentalist, brilliant guy. And so somebody said, "You really got to take a lesson with Bill." And so I went over to his house, and you know, just 
musical history, you know, kind of tucked away in every corner. And he's a really nice, welcoming guy. And, you know, he's like, well, what do you know about the banjo? And I was like, honestly, not much, you know. Well, what do you want to learn today? I'm like, I, I don't know, maybe a tune or two. He's like, all right, well, if you don't know much, let's start at the beginning. And he basically said, we're going to take this whole thing apart and put it back together and make sure, you, you know, so like we totally deconstructed it, put it back together. He taught me one tune and sent me on my way. <laughs> What do you think the most important things that he taught you were that you maybe wouldn't have picked up on your own? He's like a science guy, you know, so it was all about like tension. I mean, he just was he, much more methodical, uh, you know, than I, I was just kind of like going to play it until it fall apart, probably, you know, but he's like, no, you got to really <laughs> understand where, where it's pulling on itself and how it, you know, what to look for to make sure it's in good shape. How do you know when you need to go get to, you know, fret job, all that stuff. He kind of just was, mm. you know. I feel like I learned a lot, a lot right there, but well, well. Speaking of that, when, when you before you started talking about the acrylic nail, you said a lot of getting the hard drive and sound was in the setup, and I thought, I thought you were going to talk about your banjo. You started talking about your nail. Yeah, yeah. But were you also? But were you also meaning to say that it's in the banjo setup? Too? Yeah, like I had to get. I think the thing I had is like a Kirshner tailpiece or something that put. You know, it came with a no knot, and I, that that wasn't going to work for me. So I've tried a bunch of those different hmm. tailpieces that put a lot of counter pressure and. Um, you know, were you, were you pulling the strings off of the bridge or something? Is that what the problem was? Yeah. Or just like, you know, it wasn't staying in tune and the bridge was moving and I'm like, you know, this oh. wasn't, wasn't <laughs> pulling it off. It just was like, you know, felt like it wasn't for as hard as I wanted to play it. It wasn't really, um, it's not stable set up yeah. tight enough to, you know, that makes sense. I don't know. Maybe, maybe most people, uh, don't have that problem, but I don't know. It, it came, it felt like it was not meant to be played. Like it wasn't meant to be taken out of the house. <laughs> Very delicate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. So what other, I mean, did you end up discovering other players that you feel influenced you? And if so, who who were those players and how do you, what do you think you got from them? Yeah, I mean, I got into like a lot of different styles, I guess. Um, you know, like I really fell in love with Doc Boggs early on. like listening to that style and and as much the singing as anything which is i think how i come to music first anyways as a as a singer but um because i just you know i kind of grew i feel like i came out of the womb singing you know and uh wow. so i just like think think about his his approach to singing and the banjo and how how eerie and awesome it was and um i grew up I remember watching a lot of Hee Haw in, in uh, yeah. my, my uh, grandparents' house. And so, like, once I realized what I was doing again, and I was like, oh, that kind of feels connected to some stuff I did as a kid. Went back and, like, got into string bean and stuff a little bit, you know. Mm. Uh, Roy Andrade, uh, I think is uh, the guy's name in uh, Real Time Travelers. Yeah. Um, who I found because, you know, I'm a huge fan of Martha Scanlon's songwriting. And so the Real Time Travelers, you know, were a big, big band out of the Pacific North, or old time band out of the Pacific Northwest. I think for, you know, he, he uh, in particular, I fell in love with this song of hers. It's called Seeds of the Pine, I think. And there's a really beautiful live recording of them.
listening to it on YouTube and I was still pretty early learning to play the banjo and and he, this guy plays just these beautiful lines and I couldn't I couldn't figure it out um you know and I'm like well it doesn't seem like he's tuned the same way as me you know like what I can't right. figure out what's going on here um and so then I kind of messed around with it a little bit and I was like oh there's that's the thing people play in a lot of different tunings than claw hammer you know <laughs> so like, maybe I need another lesson or two so I went and got some more lessons uh from a from a, a gentleman over at this place called the Homestead Pick and Parlor, which is a, another institution here in uh, the Minneapolis area. It's in Richfield, actually, but it's it's a wonderful place, a uh, great resource, lots of instruction and stuff. But anyway, hearing that song and wanting to like be able to play that way, I you know I kind of feel like I came I came by it all honestly, you know, because like I've just been trying to keep up with my band, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, which are like these friends of mine who are all I feel like considerably uh, better musicians from where I started, you know, so I've been trying to keep pace and catch up. And uh, that's definitely a unique uh, situation, almost being in the band before you know right. yeah. how to play, <laughs> how to do what you're yeah, supposed it just to feels do in the band. Very organic and weird, but, um, you know, like I, I feel like it's really worked um, for me anyway. I feel like I, I, I love like getting into like old time circles and playing tunes now and, I mean, like all, all the things that maybe people would experience, you know, first, I, I feel like I came too later, you know, but I'm like, yeah. oh, this is really sweet. I, would, I could do this the rest of my life. And now a word from our sponsors, but we will be right back with the episode in just a few moments. The Picky Fingers podcast is thrilled to be sponsored by Peghead Nation, the top site for instructional video courses in banjo, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, dobro, upright bass, and ukulele. You're going to learn bluegrass, old time, and other styles from some of the most talented players and instructors in all of Roots music. Go to pegheadnation.com to see their great lineup of courses. Here are some of the choices just for banjo. Beginning banjo and bluegrass banjo with Bill Evans. Clawhammer banjo with Evie Layden. Wade Ward style banjo with Bruce Molsky. The banjo according to Danny Barnes. And contemporary bluegrass banjo with Wes Corbett. All of these courses include high quality multi-angle video lessons, downloadable notation and tablature, play along tracks, and plenty of tunes and songs to play. The best part is that just for being a Picky Fingers podcast listener, you are going to get your first month free. So head over to pegheadnation.com and use the promo code PICKYFINGERS at checkout. That's pegheadnation.com and Picky Fingers, all one word, all lowercase, at checkout. I'm so proud to welcome a new sponsor to the podcast. That's Paige Capos. Paige has been family owned right here in my home state of Michigan since Brian and Ralph Page started the business way back in 1988. Since then, Paige has become known for its high quality capos for all the instruments. And folks, they have three different lines of capos. So whether you are just figuring out how these things work, right on up to if you are a demanding studio or stage professional, Paige has a product for you. And just when you thought there couldn't possibly be anything new in the capo design world, they are proving that wrong with their new Page Pro series. I can tell you firsthand that the innovative patented design on these new Page Pro capos is second to none in both the tone quality, it sounds like you're not playing with a capo at all, and also the tuning stability. It's pretty amazing and you owe it to yourself to check them out. So head over to pagecapo.com. That's P-A-I-G-E capo.com. The Picky Fingers podcast is also sponsored by Elderly Instruments. I have been so lucky to have Elderly Instruments as my local family-owned music store for as long as I can remember. But they are more than just that. They are the world's most trusted source for new used and vintage fretted instruments, which means they're the first place you should check for any of your banjo, mandolin, guitar, ukulele needs, instructional materials, and all the accessories to go with it. And the other part is that Elderly is just as well known for their excellent customer service as for their amazing selection of products. So head over to Elderly.com to see their full inventory or give them a call to talk to one of their helpful and professional sales representatives. That's 517-372-7880. 
And last but not least, we have another family-owned business in Sullivan Banjos supporting the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. A lot of you know that I have been playing my Sullivan Banjo for about 20 years now, and I'm here to tell you that it is sounding better than ever. Now, fortunately for you, Eric is still maintaining that high Sullivan quality and he is ready, willing, and able to build you the banjo of your dreams, whether you just want a tried and true traditional design on up through your wildest custom dream banjo. Eric is here to build it for you. Head on over to SullivanBanjo.com, email SullivanBanjo at gmail.com, or just go the old-fashioned way. Call up Eric Sullivan at 502-365-5022 get that legendary Sullivan tone with that added personal touch of being able to design your banjo with the person who's actually building it for you. So throughout all these different influences that you've had, is there anything that you feel is important that you've incorporated into like your own performing and playing or songwriting? Or I guess another way to ask it would be like, what do you consider some elements of like your personal style? Yeah, I feel like the songs that I write, I write on the banjo. And so, you know, like everything I write is kind of written for the band that I'm in, you know, Hmm. it's kind of, I feel like that what's unique about it is that it is as a band, I think we're one of the more eclectic string bands out there from the perspective of the fact that we have like four really different songwriters that that all like to write songs and sing and we love each other's work and like we're you know it's very familial and supportive and um so in terms of like what from my style is incorporated into my writing i feel like it's all been an experiment you know so like um Mm -hmm. on the last record oh go ahead i i you were going exactly where I was going to ask. I was going to say, like, maybe there's an example of, like, something yeah. you've written that you, uh, yeah, yeah. whatever, yeah, developed on, this, on the banjo or something. Yeah, on this last record, I, I, I we recorded something that is, like, unlike anything I've ever done before. And it's definitely not a Charlie Poole-inspired song whatsoever, you know. But, like, it got uh-huh. me thinking about his, you know, kind of two-finger style and... And, you know, I, I, like I said, I haven't done anything like it before, but I felt like, oh, there's like a, there's something here that feels like there's a theme here and like the words really came and felt important to me. And I just kind of was like, I I think this needs to be on the record. And everybody was like, yeah, let's do it. It's different. (laughs) It's beautiful. And, you know, we put a little bit of slide guitar on there, which there's a lot of slide on this latest record, but that's, you know a newer thing for us too. And just like, kind of, I feel like as we go along, we're like each, each record is like been another layer. You know what I mean? And yeah. um, Yeah. There's like songs that, uh, that the guitar player Jay writes where he's, he's not really writing straight ahead, you know, folk tunes. He's, he's got a lot of different varied influences and like i've gotten a lot of opportunity to like figure out well what's my part going to be on this like this isn't a normal claw hammer song you know like how the heck is a claw hammer player supposed to not just go take a break during this song (laughs) you know and uh so it's it's opened a lot of i think weird doors that that have been really fun to walk through and and kind of learn so i sometimes I, i i tell especially like you know the fiddle and mandolin player uh that we play with nate sype who he doesn't live in minnesota anymore you know those are the days where Mm. we just like hey come on over we'll play tunes and you could just do that right in the living room but now he he flies in for shows but you know back in the day i'd say he was my most influential banjo teacher you know and he he doesn't really play banjo he'd just be like no i think that's not quite right what if you did and we'd just slow stuff down and work (laughs) on it together and like all right, there we go. That's that tune. So yeah, anyway, a little more of an ob- objective kind of listener to yeah to reflect and to learn together. Of, yeah. You know, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which has been fun. Anyway, I can do this little one for you if you want. Um, yeah, of course. It's called "Lay Down Your Burdens," um, and I think I remember it. <laughs> it goes something like this. Oh, 
when you're lonesome and feeling blue You're not alone, dear, it's not just you your best Lay down your burdens and take a rest Oh, when that distance has stretched and grown got sorrows more than you've known It leaves you lonesome and feeling blue You're not alone, dear, it's not just you Is strong. You'll find your hope and that you're still you. It leaves you lonesome and feeling blue. You're not alone, dear. It's not just you. Yeah, excellent, man. Yeah. So that was something you wrote what as a banjo melody first? Is that is that kind of what you were trying to illustrate with how the banjo is incorporated into that writing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it was a it was a melody that I had come up with that I just I thought was like pretty and like, hey, we can we write a song around this? And it like, you know, real broke yeah. down where the melody just follows the voice and it kind of stays broke down like that. And it's not characteristic of the band, that's for sure, um, that, that we're in. But uh -huh. uh, we write some some nice kind of expansive songs, too, that are like that. And so it felt like it wasn't too much of a, a stretch. And so we, we, we actually recorded that one. Uh, the project before this, we tried to put it on that record. Um, but it didn't, it didn't quite fit. We had like a little different treatment to it with the banjo. And Nate and Justin, the, the fiddle and mandolin player, were like, you know, we think we can kind of write a part to it uh that would be different and so that would end that's what ended up in this record and i really like it it's a it's the sort of thing people need to hear you know that everybody is kind of wandering through this world not sure where they're headed and uh a lot of times things don't go the way you want them to and you know you don't have to be alone in it and um really this for me a call to arms for for people to just support each other you know yeah yeah for sure and definitely delivered in a very digestible way, almost like a Stephen Foster kind of song so sounding thing. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I think your main point with your eclecticness was like, I don't know, something like out of time, like really right. caught my ear. It's yeah. like, it almost sounds like a Metallica song yeah. played yeah. on acoustic instruments or something like that. By elections, by
Jay and Ryan. Um, Ryan still collaborates with us a lot. He recorded this last record with us, and those two guys, you know, when we were growing up, they're in a bunch of different metal bands. Um, so like, that, oh, for that, real? Yeah, that influence <laughs> is real. Um, and and he's always kind of like, you know, he'll he'll bring this to us. And and most of the guys in the band, uh, you know, listen to a lot of this music i think he's come to listen to this music you know because we've brought it to him and, and we love playing music together but sometimes he'll be like you know i don't know if you guys are gonna like this one and like almost without fail we're just like that is an amazing song we have to figure out how to do that you know in this yeah. project so it's fun because it really stretches the sound you know you know from what i can tell a lot of the gigs and the festivals you play you guys get roped into this larger i guess i'll just call it like the jam grass scene yeah i think that's probably where people put us i don't know if that's yeah yeah but i i mean i guess in a way that's like surprising for an old time-ish band but do you like why do you think that is 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 that the reason that you have these like different sounding tunes or how would you explain how you've been embraced by this community that might I don't know might normally be not associated with like an old time band. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. I mean, some of it is I think we knew about all the hippie festivals before we knew about the bluegrass festivals. You know, like <laughs> yeah. like that's where all our friends were going, and we're like, hey, we can we should bring these instruments there. Yeah, can um, we play too? <laughs> yeah, you know, and um, I think a lot of it has to do with like how much energy and like we're trying to be the soundtrack to this evening's party everywhere we go, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, um, we're not a band that's going to go out and write a set list and is like, we got to play them all the new material. We really want to hear, you know, like we want to keep working on this stuff. You know, it's like, oh, this is a, a party crowd and they're going to want to dance. And so let's mm -hmm. make sure we just play mostly songs Slam that are going to make yeah. that happen, you know? Yeah. Like, I think with a name like ours, it's no wonder so few people have heard of us and uh you know but like once you see us i think most people will come back you know what i mean like we are definitely yeah. a band to see live we're just a bunch of friends that have been playing together for 20 years having the time of our lives still 20 years later you know um and i think that's a testament to to what music can do for you i feel like it's you know it's built this big community and it's it's yeah as far as like how how we get lumped into that bucket versus another I, I guess i don't know we've always kind of been like just put us in as many buckets as you can <laughs> you know right uh, yeah i think you might have hit the nail on the head maybe the maybe what appeals to the jam grass crowd isn't so much like you need to play 20 minute jams with three finger style banjo and lots of reverb and effects uh maybe it's more just about you seeing you guys have fun and just bringing energy to the yeah. to the situation. Yeah, I think that feels right. Yeah. Yep. How else would you describe the band? Do you guys do you guys improvise a lot and like where along that spectrum are yeah. you? I mean, I think we're more we're closer to, you know, like a a punk rock band. You're going to hear like, you know, 15 songs in a set, not 8, you know. Um, <laughs> but we do a lot of improvisation um there aren't very many solos or hooks that are like pre-prescribed or written i mean there's some like jay has the song on this most recent record out of time one and that's got like this really cool kind of irish inspired you know kind of melody that is a hook that keeps coming back I think you know the improvisation that we do we, we probably have a song or two that we get spacey and like you know because if that's what the occasion calls for we can do that but I, I wouldn't say it's like something that whereas with most people you know you're going to get a bunch of that at some of the club shows i think with us you know some nights you might not get that at all and we're not gonna it's not a, it's not a recipe we kind of we don't play the same set two nights in a row you know we don't we just kind of try to keep it fresh. Although I wouldn't know yeah. I'm not allowed to write the set lists, which, <laughs> you know. I'd be perfectly happy to be not allowed to write the set lists. That's just one of those 
annoying tasks yeah. for me. Like, yeah. no, someone else do it. I'll just play whatever. Yeah. The only risk in that being your approach to life, which is certainly mine, uh, is that there are a lot of shows where I'm like, oh, man. I think I'm going to be tuning between every single one of these songs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did anybody remember that I was here tonight? I don't know. <laughs> you know, like I'm a three-finger player, so I don't deal with oh, quite yeah, as yeah, many yeah. tunings as you right, do. So right. everything's just a capo away. Yeah, I like that. I wish that could yeah. happen. Uh, yes. Or just, you know, that we could travel with three banjos, but sometimes one's go. too many, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me. I like it. Hey, uh, you you sort of started to tell us about it, but I'll make you revisit it. The the band's setup, like going from one mic to now you said there's two mics and I imagine there's like some instrument lines happening. Describe what your live setup is and how do you how do you deal with having one mic or two mics when you have four singers? Yeah. Um so we we play this this rock club in Minneapolis that just recently went, went out of business, but, um, or, you know, changed owners or whatever. They're not really a, a music venue anymore, but it's a big, big roadhouse, 1100 people or so. And it was really loud place where like guaranteed 50% of the people were not there to hear you on any given night, you know? So okay. we, we were playing a lot of our early big shows in this room and like, you know, we we're vibey people were like, have you seen this new local band? And then, you know, we were in this, on this big stage and the sound guys were, really rough around the edges there but super sweetheart guys and <laughs> first or second second maybe night uh, that we were there like one of the guys came up to us and said you know great show guys that was that really it looked like one of the best shows you've ever played i wish i could have heard anything you did um and the we're, sound guy yeah, said that to yeah, you. yeah 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 okay and, and that's... We, were, we were just crushed you know he's like I, I gave it everything i could you know but like this is a rock club if this is the type of place you want to play it is going to be this loud, you know. Can you hear? Can you hear how loud it is right now? It was that loud while you were playing, you know. So, and this is when you were doing oh a single mic, setup? single mic with like a couple of auxiliary, um, okay. solo mics, you know. And it's great for a theater setup. We still, you know, when we when we can, if we or if we go into a radio, uh, you know, kind of setting, like it's fun, really fun still to do that. But they were just basically like, you know, if you're going to keep doing that in this setting, like here's the things you should think about, you know. And so the two main things they told us were, you know, plug in your instruments, and we know that that's a big compromise. And you know, I feel like I spent a decade trying to figure out like how can I strike that compromise to play at the volumes we have to while still playing an instrument that's meant to be acoustic and not uh, yeah. play that loud. So that was the one big thing that they that they kind of instilled in us is everybody's got to figure out how to allow the sound guy to push you up high enough in a setting where the fidelity of the audio is already a lost cause because it's so loud, you know? So Yeah, like it's already a compromise yeah, no matter what. Yeah. yeah. So so that was one thing and we did that and we kept we kept the large diaphragm to sing around for a while. Um, but that was the first kind of step that we took. And then another, I don't know, four or five years in, they were like, hey, you guys have gotten really good at singing cheek to cheek. You mix yourselves really well around that one mic. But now that mic is kind of the bottleneck because it's a large diaphragm. You can only turn it up so loud. And they kind of encourage... You were still trying to play like rowdy places. Yeah. And they're like, you, you know, you should think about SM... 55 super 55 because it's got the same capsule as a 58 like this but it's just in a little wider housing and that's the elvis looking yeah, mic right, right yeah. yeah and they're like you know you'd have all kinds of headroom with that and we think it would solve your problems and we're like well we'll try anything once and we kind of never looked back we you know we, we tried it in that room for the first time and the vocals were suddenly popping through which is you know we, we do a lot of harmony singing um you know uh -huh. in, in we we just love that aspect of it. So um, I think that's like, as far as our live setup, that's that's a pretty big thing for us is just like how we've had to kind of figure out the sound reinforcement to be able to play in places that are as loud as they are. And so the, the solution that you came up with and what you still do is like two 55s? Yeah, we, we is, started is with just setup? one. Yeah, right now there's two. We started with just one 55. Um, but then in through COVID, you know, for a little bit, everybody's like required, like whether we wanted to or not to have their own mic on stage. Cause everybody had to like stay apart. If the show, oh. there's some of that. 
Uh, and then that was over, but we were like, well, that was, there was some part of that that was nice for the vocals, you know, to mix better when you're not just mixing yourself spatially around one mic and it's that loud. And so we were like, well, what if we kind of compromise? I think we had seen, we had just recently, like the year before, seen the McCurries do that, uh, Del McCurry band do that. And we were like, oh, that's really nice. Look at that. Del's got his own mic, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, as he should. And so we were like, well, we could maybe do that. Uh, and they do it with large diaphragms, but we just decided to do it with those two Super 55s. Is there a system in terms of the lead singer goes on this mic and backing vocals go on this other mic? Or what's the... Or there's like just... a stage right and stage left mic, and for the most part, like there's two main singers that are on stage right, and two main singers that are on stage left. And so, if one of those singers is leading, they sing in front of that mic, and then if there's somebody on their side of the stage that's singing back up, you know, you go over to the other mic. They go to the other yeah. side. Got it. So we try to like whichever one is the main mic we try to do you know when we can and some of the songs just doesn't work because they're too you know there's like callbacks or you know there's five of us singing you know so then we just kind of gang vocal it still but yeah everything's just yeah. out the window at yeah, that yeah, point just yeah. just sing at a mic if they're yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> so what about your personal setup you already mentioned how how it's notoriously difficult to take this acoustic instrument and make it loud what yeah. or what what is your current setup to yeah do that? i feel like i've tried everything but maybe yeah current setup is probably the right thing to say because maybe i'll maybe i'll keep fiddling with it let's see i use the felix 2 from um uh grace designs um, yeah and that's really nice that with the two kind of independent channels so i send like one channel you know, that's from a beta 98, I think, uh, that's zip tied mm -hmm. inside the banjo. And then I've got okay. a sh shot and, um, a shot and DI, which is like a under bridge DI. I just, it's actually an under, I, I, uh, super glued under the middle foot of the, of the head. And then okay. I send the sound guy two clean channels, you know, one of the mic and one of the piezo. And I just, you know, kind of come up with my little spiel that I tell them, you know, neither one of them sounds good independently. One of them sounds really bad independently. So, if, but if you like work really hard <laughs> on EQing each single independently and bring them together, they magically start to sound like a banjo. Um, yeah. And, and you've, You've found that allowing the sound guy to do that rather than blending them on board yourself is tends to work better. I don't think any of those are good solutions, honestly. And so, like, mm -hmm. uh, without traveling with our own sound guy, I think I have tended to just decide to like let the person do their best at tuning in the room. Uh, I am wireless. So like if it sounds, if I'm hearing from oh. stage, like it's uh, like, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. Then I will like get off and like walk out and like, you know, play a little bit out there and like try to give some guidance if it's needed. But you know, like the mic is just really warm. It gives a lot of the kind of, it's it almost like to the extent of being muddy if it's not brightened up. So it needs a lot of EQ help to, you know, kind of bring out the, 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 the brightness out of the mic and then uh -huh. the piezo sounds just terrible. I mean, it's like very, like very tinny, you know. Um, yeah, so I've had to, one of those. So it's you have to pretty... really like, you know. And then I tell them if you use like thirty percent of this and you know seventy percent of the mic, because you get from the even if that piezo is sounding really harsh, you get a lot of nice like attack. Uh, it does like beef up the the sound a little bit, which is a, can get a little washed with the with the mic. Yeah. In a loud environment, that's just where your bass volume comes from, is, mm -hmm. is having yeah. that. What about the banjo itself? What are you playing? Uh, I play, I have two Bart Ryder standards. So he's a maker oh, actually great. from your home state there. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, and he, he's really uh, made some great banjos. Uh, I don't think he's making them anymore, but there's still a lot of them around. No. Um, exactly. And he, like I had said before, Nate, the, the mandolin player, worked at a guitar shop and he's like, hey, we got this new open back in and you know you should come check it out and i immediately fell in love with this standard and i bought it and uh eventually i sent it back to bart and he scooped out the neck for me and then i was like okay i'm gonna order another one of these then so i got two of them 
and I tried for a long time to travel with both of them because all the tuning and stuff, and I'd have one in double C and one in open G. I mean, I I just never liked how they, I felt like they didn't sound similar enough, even though they were like, you know, uh, 400 they, apart or whatever in terms of like how, where he made them in, in the history of yeah. his banjos and like they just didn't you know i I would like get the drum the drum uh head tuner out and like be trying to like okay everything is like 88 pounds or whatever <laughs> everywhere you know now they're gonna sound the same and we go out on the road and they just wouldn't ever sound enough alike for me to not feel like the sound guy would have to like make some eq adjustments between the two okay but it's i still more have trouble the, than it's worth yeah, yeah. it felt yeah. like it i don't know if that was just me saying that or if it really was but gotcha yeah Anything else that you're particular about in terms of like types of strings, type of bridge, head? You already mentioned that you're you switched to the what Kirshner tailpiece. Yep, Kirshner tailpiece. Yep, and then um, I use uh, Rick Sampson's uh, kind of uh, reclaimed wood uh, bridges. He's got a bunch. He's a Wisconsin maker, and he gets a bunch of old growth uh, wood out of Lake Superior. Uh, so it's like submerged yeah. wood. It's uh, really nice stuff. And uh, he's a nice guy. Um, I really like his bridges. And uh, he's a res- Renaissance head. And I use the GHS almost medium um, mm. strings. So Nice. And you mentioned like an 88 on the drum dial. Is that actually the number that you I mean, I for? stopped paying attention to that when I stopped traveling with both banjos, but I, I kind of you know, <laughs> do, do it by feel um, more than anything now. But uh, I did, you know, I was trying to be really serious about it because I was like, that must be the variable that's off and I can figure out how to control that. And yeah, you know, I don't know. Well, especially because Bart is probably like one of the most consistent oh my gosh. builders they look you couldn't uh, tell that they were not exactly the same uh, yeah and right. i mean he yeah what a legacy he's that those are amazing banjos yep totally agree it, anything else to say about either either your playing or we kind of brushed on the new album when did the when did that new album come out it's called waiting days it's by called the way. waiting days yeah it came out in october um yeah so that's brand new yeah Yep, and we're really excited about it. It's uh it you know, we our last record came out like right in the middle of the pandemic, you know. Um I think everything closed <laughs> down in like March and we had a re- record in the can ready to go that was slated for release in June. Yeah. And we were like, do we hold it or do we just go? And then, you know, we're like, let's go. How long yeah. could this take? And everybody <laughs> knows how that story ended uh so you know we we released a record three months into the pandemic and so this is the first one since that and you know we were just really excited to get the new music out there and uh tour around it which has been really fun yeah waiting days is an interesting song too uh, you know i have the pleasure of singing a lot of songs that nate has written over the years um and that's that's another one let's take a long drive out to the country and look at Uh, he and I, a, a while ago, had uh, collaborated with this uh, this director and this actor and another musician friend of ours, and had uh, written some music for a play, um, and and performed in the play for a little bit anyway. And one of the songs that Nate had written for the for the play was this was a version of this Waiting Days song. And so sometimes I think about like all the different lives that song has had. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that it was an interesting uh, uh, play too. It's the only time I've ever played a banjo with nylon nylon strings. So you know, oh, through nice. this through this like six month run or whatever it was that we were working on it, I was using whatever those black nylon strings are, which are really nice. Um, was there something about the play? Was it supposed to be like a Shakespearean era thing that it was, made it was, you, it was, that the nylon strings yeah. was more appropriate or what? Yeah, it was like themed on um, the book Moby Dick. So it was like, oh. you know, 
Uh, and it was just too loud compared to the other instruments without without that modification okay. too. But it also was more period appropriate, probably too. Nice. And how do you guys record? Uh, it, it strikes me that you know, for an old time band that even on stage just kind of gangs around these two mics, what's your studio approach like? Similar? Somewhat similar. Um, I mean, we've recorded a lot of different ways. We've definitely recorded things live um, on this last record. I don't think anything was recorded live on this last record. I think like all the foundation tracks are recorded like live together in a in a room, you know, and you're like, mm -hmm. we, we kind of often will leave, you know, space to track in solos and track in the vocals later. Um, that's probably our yeah. most typical approach. Um, kind of the most efficient approach, I guess, as we've found over the years. And we've been working a lot with, with Ryan Young, um, who was our original fiddle player, like I mentioned, and he's got a studio in Crystal. And so like, you know, just like a old friend collaborating, still collaborating with, you know, he did our first bunch of records and he's done our last bunch of records too. We worked yeah. with somebody else kind of in the middle for a while, but it's been really fun. Just like super, it's a good, comfortable situation. Yeah, yeah. Able to be really, yeah, that's great. you know, creative and explore stuff and know that you can trust this you know friend of yours to be like that's a bad idea <laughs> you know or like oh that's cool you know like you right, know. right so anyway yeah anything else to say about about your banjo style or anything else that we should know about your story before we before we close up here i don't know i mean i i feel like um I've taken a bunch of lessons, but I'd say I'm mostly self-taught. Like I feel like I, I I know a lot of claw hammer players who'd be like, "Oh, I play round peak style," or I play, you know, like they've got some real specific yeah. like regional influence. And you know, I feel like um, my biggest influence has been trying to figure out how to play claw hammer banjo like in this band, you know, to mm -hmm. to make it fit because I was already there. I wasn't going anywhere else, you know. <laughs> um, and so, like, you know, I've I've, I've been a real a fan of a lot of different kinds of claw hammer players over the years. Like even here in, in the, in the Midwest, there's a band called horseshoes and hand grenades uh, out of sure. Wisconsin. And there's yeah. a, a, the banjo player there, his name is Russ. And you know, he's my favorite banjo player, you know, like I could listen to him oh, all, all cool. day and night, you know, uh, it's just yeah. fun to like, um, I feel like there's just a big community of people here. And yeah, as far as my style, uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I hope I have a style. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're making your own style. It's the custom, you know, Pertnier Sandstone style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, it it, it really comes down to, in, in old time music anyway, I feel like it comes down to like, oftentimes like, the fiddle player you're playing with and the tunes that you're playing together and like, you know, what the source of those tunes are. And like with YouTube and stuff these days, it's so easy to be like, Oh man, there's this great recording of Brad Leftwich, you know, who's another uh, great musician out of the Midwest. And, you know, he's mm -hmm. playing this tune and we, sh we should do this tune. I love this tune. And so then everybody goes home and does the homework and we figure it out. How, how we're going to play it together, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It just feels like it's uh, music that's already notoriously the most accessible has become even more accessible, you know, yeah. as far as like folk and uh, acoustic music in general. Yeah. It kind of makes it so those regional styles that you talked about, it kind of blurs the lines now that everyone can hear what's going on everywhere else. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. wonder if the regional styles might, fall away for better or worse yeah i wonder i mean there's still some mm. things that i feel like you know that where even today you can see that though you know like uh mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember the band split lip rayfield oh yeah yeah your skin falls off your hair falls out your teeth all rot you've got the gout you can animate the skeleton is that the best that can be done Oh.
they were just like this massive influence in Kansas and, and way beyond. But like in Kansas, it was interesting. Like when we were a band in Minnesota and then like touring up, you know, to, to Kansas where we knew these guys were from, like you felt like when you had an opening band that's from the area, like I wonder how much like split lip they're going to sound. And oftentimes it was a lot like split lip like you know just wow. this foot stomping like they have a very kansas kind of style um i don't know there's like a, another great band called the calamity cubes and dracar sauna and all these bands that were like around that region at the time that i feel like had this vibe and you know i feel like in the midwest a lot of people will be like oh a lot of these bands sound like trampled by turtles because they have a very like prominent sound in the midwest and i think have influenced a lot of people and a lot of people's sounds and you know yonder certainly like has had this huge impact on like what the colorado sound is and a lot of those jam grass bands now that are like you know everything's come from yonder yeah yeah from you know pretty much yeah in michigan here there's like a lot of us wonder if there's darwin's the finches on Galapagos Island thing happening because Michigan's surrounded by lakes. And so not a lot of touring bands come up into Michigan mm. and a lot of us just play in the state. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we kind of wonder if we're just evolving our own little I music like ecosystem here. Yeah. yeah that's it's cool. cool. We have, you know, we have great musicians here, Yeah, but, you know, they're everywhere of course, yeah. but green sky interesting stuff it comes from there. Right. And, uh, Green Sky, Billy, Billy yeah. Lindsay, yeah. Lindsay, oh man, tons of tons. Man, of we just saw Lindsay. She is so good. I was in her band when she was in Michigan. Oh, I was awesome! A, real, real proud of all those folks. Oh, for sure. yeah, really interesting to see all that. Yeah, drop some, uh, drop some websites, man. How do people check you out? Oh yeah, and, uh, find your tour dates and your recordings. Yeah, we're at pertnearsandstone.com. Um, Britain, your sandstone on the instas, uh, and I think on the Twitters too, or we might be putting your music there. I don't know. Um, and <laughs> okay. now it's X anyway, so whatever. I don't know if any of that matters these days. Uh, but yeah, we're out there on the interwebs for sure. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, great chatting with you, great meeting you, and uh, hope to see you. Hope to see you around sometime. Yeah, I know thanks, you're coming Keith. to Michigan in February. We but are, you're, yeah. You're coming to the part of Michigan that's like 11 hours away from where oh, I am. Oh, man. It's, it seems impossible that anywhere in my state should be 11 hours away. That's amazing. Yeah, we go this way to go. get there, you know. We don't go I know this you do. way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For sure. Well, cool, man. Well, hey, man. Great talking to you. Thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. That's going to wrap up this episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. You did hear some song clips in this episode, and I have to say, these are the most interesting titles for song clips of any episode thus far. Check it out. In order, they were I've Been Traveling by Pertnear Sandstone, Ain't It a Shame to Whip Your Wife on Sunday by the New Lost City Ramblers, Hawks Got a Chicken and Flew in the Woods by the Wilders, Sally Ann by High on the Hog, Cumberland Gap by Doc Boggs, Seeds of the Pine by Martha Scanlon, Out of Time and then Waiting Days, both by Pertnear Sandstone, and then finally The High Price of Necromancy by Split Lip Rayfield. Thank you once again to Tom Donovan. He's today's VIP Patreon supporter of the show. Become a supporter yourself. Go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast. Throw in a few dollars to keep this show up and running. Get your Picky Fingers merch over at banjopodcast.com. Drop me a line, pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. That's going to do it for me, folks. I'll see you all next time. They don't trust me for anything, you know? <laughs>